Can you tell me a little bit about that moment, what happened? Because you, know, you said you were like, just you know, not feeling the best. I, I wasn't. And, and, and I made a conscious decision when I got cancer back in 2012, that I was never going to take out my fear, my anxiety, my uh, fatigue on a nurse, a doctor, a therapist, somebody who was trying to help me heal or get better. And because I've had so many IVs and infusions and things like that, they were having a hard time getting an IV needle in me. And they sent this one nurse in and, and she tried a couple times and I was giving her a hard time. I'm like, no, don't go there. You're not gonna get it. No, don't go. She went there anyway. I'm like, I told you. And I was, I was being a jerk. First of all, Terry, welcome to Zest to Live. I'm so excited to have you today in the studio. You know, we are going to talk so much today about so many things. How are you feeling today? I am doing great. Thank you very much for having me on. It's good seeing you again, and I'm looking forward to talking with you as well. So, you know, I host another different podcast, which is namely a Spirituality with the Twist. And, you know, you've been on there. We talked so many stuff, you know, like amazing stuff about your journey, about all of those things. And, you know, I don't in, I, like you're one of the first guests that I have invited back on this, like a different show that I'm doing right now, because, you know, you know, your story was something that just not motivated the existing listen that I had on that show, but also myself. I feel that. And, you know, I think a lot of people could, you know, know that story at the same time, get so much in like insights from what you have to offer. So, you know, why don't you tell us from the beginning how this journey started? Because, you know, I think a lot of your journey started after you entered in that 20s. You know, that's where it began. It's, for you, it was not the childhood. For you, it was not the teenage. For you, it was, I think, the puberty was not the place. It was the adulthood when everything began for you. Is that right? So tell us everything, you know, how that journey began for you. Sure, I, I think you're absolutely right. When I graduated from college, I was actually the first person in my family to graduate from college. I moved home to find a job, and I'm going to date myself now. This was long before the internet was available to help people find employment. I was lucky. I, I, I found my first job in the corporate headquarters of a fast food company in their marketing department. That was the good news. The bad news was I lived with my parents for the next three and a half years as I helped my mother care for my father and my grandmother, who were both dying of different forms of cancer. Professionally, as I said, started out in marketing, and then I went to work for the hospital that cared for my father and my grandmother. And then I made that major pivot in my life and became a police officer. And part of what I did during my law enforcement career was I was a SWAT team hostage negotiator. After that, I started a school security consulting business. I coached girls high school basketball. I became an author in 2020. But for the last 12 years now, I've been battling a rare form of cancer, a rare form of melanoma. And then I guess just finally, my wife and I have been married for 30 years. We have one child, a daughter, uh, who is in the military here in the United States. So, you know, when you had this cancer it was a big moment for you you know because you know i feel i've said this many times in so many places we don't know the value of our body we don't know the value you know the bible says that okay the body is valuable the, the every religious book says you know god has given you a great life great body take care of it you know we don't worry much we think okay we're gonna eat junk food we're gonna drink alcohol you know and we don't you know, worry until something really happens, then we realize the value. Something happens to our eyes, we start wearing glasses, then we realize, okay, how valuable my normal eyes were. But cancer, you only hear these terms. You think, okay, you know, it must be something. Never thought that would happen to me is something, you know, happens. And, and at least for you, you were like a fit basketball coach. And, you know, I remember when we had the last time conversation, you thought to yourself, like, what did I do that I had to face this? What, what wrong did I do? And you had that thought, I remember you were telling me. So, you know, how was that moment for you when you got to know about cancer? And how that, did that happen? Like, you know, can you tell me a little bit of that background? And what was like after it, like the aftermath thing when you got the news about the cancer? Sure. So at the time, I was, a, I was, I was coaching girls high school basketball in Texas. 
And I had a callus break open on the bottom of my left foot, right below my third toe. And initially, I did not think much of it because as a coach, you're on your feet a lot. But after a few weeks of it not healing, I made an appointment and went to see a podiatrist, a foot doctor friend of mine. And he took an x-ray and he said, Terry, I think you have a cyst in there and I can cut it out. And he did. And he showed it to me. It was just a little gelatin sack with some white fat in it. No dark spots, no blood, nothing that gave either one of us concern. But fortunately or unfortunately, he sent it off to pathology to have it looked at. And then two weeks later, I received the call for him that really changed my life. And as I mentioned, he was a friend. And the more difficulty he was having explaining to me what was going on, the more frightened I was becoming until finally he just laid it out for me. He said, Terry, I've been a doctor for 25 years and I have never seen the form of cancer that you have. You have an incredibly rare form of melanoma. And most people think of melanoma as too much exposure to the sun and it affects the melon, the pigment in our skin. Mine has nothing to do with sun exposure. It's just a rare form that appears on the bottom of the feet, in my case, or the palms of the hands. And so you're right. I was like, are you kidding me? I, I have done everything right in my life to make sure that I didn't get cancer. And I know I went through all the stages that we would associate with grief. You know, first it was the denial. I can't possibly have cancer. I've done everything right. And then I got mad. It was like, I can't possibly have cancer. I've done everything right. And then I got to a point where there was sort of a bargaining with God. Our daughter was in high school when I was diagnosed. And it was like, hey, just let me live long enough to see her graduate from high school. And then I absolutely got down, felt sorry for myself. But then I came out the other end and said, you know what? I do not like the cards that I've been dealt here, but I'm going to have to play these cards to the best of my ability. And that's really what I've been doing. I mean, when I was diagnosed, I was told that you're probably going to be dead in two years. And I thought, well, you're giving me a death sentence. Maybe I can turn that death sentence into a life sentence. And, you know, it's been a long time since you had cancer. It's not like okay, it happened yesterday or one year, two years back. It's been a long time since you've been fighting that. And most people who have cancer, not just regular cancer, because any kind of a cancer is it's cancer, but you had one of the rarest kind of cancer, which is even hard to treat. Because I know there are a lot of people who survived it, but those people had the normal ones, which have been like the breast and all of those things, you know, which are being treated, which are being more actively researched because it's the one that is most common ones. You had the one which was the hardest or the rarest, in my opinion, and that was really hard to treat. And, you know, if I'm getting that right, you know, you were the one who was working, you had the marriage. So expenses, you know, medical, it's, it's not cheap. You know, you had to pay for expenses. Relationships get torn apart. Everything changes in an instant it does not even take a day it, everything changes slowly slowly and you know for the first uh, year or so you, know, you you cannot believe it but then you start to realize okay this is what i have to live with now i have to do what i have to do but how was your personal life affected because of it yeah that's a great question i when i was diagnosed my oncologist told me at the very least you are going to have a chronic disease which you're going to have to deal with for the rest of your life, however long that life is. On the worst side of it, you have a terminal disease that, that is going to kill you. And so I think cancer tends to isolate you. I think first you get isolated from your friends, then you get isolated from your family, and then you even get isolated from yourself. I have been incredibly fortunate that my wife and daughter and my brothers and my mother's still alive, uh, have really supported me in, in this journey because there's no way I would still be here without them. I mean, my wife has seen things in me that I, I remember one time uh, I was put on a medication called interferon and I was on it for five years. And eventually it became so toxic to my body that I ended up in the intensive care unit of the hospital 
with a body temperature of 108 degrees, which is usually not compatible with being alive. But she saw it coming. I was laying in the emergency room and she was right with me. And she said to the nurse, you need to take his temperature. And she said, oh, we, are, we just did. He said, she said, no, you need to take it again. And it was 104 at that time. And she ran out of the room, the nurse did, to get the doctors. And by the time they came back, it was all the way up to 108. And if she hadn't noticed that, I wouldn't probably be here. I would have probably just cooked my organs in my own body heat and, how and, and did that happen, like such a high temperature? How is that possible? How, what, how did it happen? It was the toxicity from this drug that I'd been like on for effect? five years. Like Say that again. It's like a side effect? Yeah, absolutely like a side effect. I, I remember my, my torso was wow. bare. I had sweatpants on, but my torso was bare. And I remember lifting my head up and kind of looking down my body. And it literally looked like the hood of an automobile that had been left out in the sun all day. There was just heat waves rising that off. That must have been super painful. Like, you know, how, how, how were you handling it yourself? Like when you were having it, like until the doctors came. How, like, it's like, you know, you've been thrown on a stove and then the fire is turned on in the one. And how, is, how did he like, and it's hard to even imagine, uh, Terry, 108. That's, yeah. that's too, too, a lot. Like you can cook a chicken. <laughs> you well, can cook a chicken. The funny thing about it was, is I was feeling just the opposite. I was freezing. I was what? so cold. Yeah, I, I mean, it was weird. I, I, They were giving me warm blankets to warm me up and stuff like that. But when I got this high fever, the blankets came off. They literally packed me in ice. I had ice on my armpits, ice in my groin, ice behind my neck. They packed me in ice to try to reduce Welcome to Luvo. This is your home screen, giving you access to all features like steps counter, water intake, mood check, heart rate, sleep, and gratitude. You can also monitor your steps, heart rate, and sleep by connecting the app with your smartwatch. Experience live meditation, yoga, and healthy eating, all of which is coming soon. Download our free app and start living your best life. The fever, and they gave me a, a hyperther or hypothermia drug. I remember just kind of, I was really kind of getting out of it. I, I don't remember a lot, but there was an orange IV bag with this orange fluid that was dripping into me, which I'm going to assume was what saved my life, that they got that to me quickly enough that, I didn't fry my organs based on the high temperature. So, you know, you have also been in business administration and like in police, that is the SWAT team and negotiations and all those things and coaching, of course, it's one of your other things that you do. How these different roles have like influenced your approach to motivation and mindset? Because you think being around the police, being in business, it's a both different things. And also doing coaching and dealing with your personal issues that you have. You know, how have these things influenced your mindset and motivation to stay alive in that sense? Yeah, another great question. I, I, I started playing basketball when I was nine years old and played all the way up until I graduated from college when I was 21. And one of the things that I believe team sports taught me now, for me, it was sports. I think it can be whatever team that you're on. And we're all on teams, whether it's our colleagues, our families, whatever it ends up being. One of the things that team sports taught me was the importance of being part of something that's bigger than yourself. You realize on a team that if you don't do your job, not only do you let yourself down, but you let your teammates down, your coaches down, your fans down, your parents down, et cetera. And if you think about it, What's the biggest team game we all play? This game of life. Life. Yeah, exactly. And, and it, it is a team game. I think if, if COVID taught us anything, it's how much we need each other. You know, during COVID, we were all isolated and alcoholism rates went up. Drug abuse rates went up. Domestic violence rates went up. We need each other. We're better together than we are separately. 
So I learned that from playing sports. I learned how to be a good teammate. I learned how to win. I learned how to lose. I learned how to work hard. I, I learned all kinds of things that affected my mindset as I grew up, as I became an adult. And certainly in law enforcement, when I was a negotiator, I mean, let's face it, if you were talking to me, you were probably having the worst day of your life. You know, I mean, you were barricaded in a room with a, with a weapon and I was trying to get you out safely. So, yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've had a lot of high intensity jobs or experiences in my life. And now I'm relegated to a wheelchair and I have no leg on my left side. And I guess what I say when people ask me, how do I reconcile those things? Is that when you can't do what you're good anymore, you do what's important. And I, I, I'm not saying that, you know, what I did wasn't important, but in the scheme of things, basketball games, I mean, is it really that important? No, it, it, it's not. Maybe what I did as a law enforcement professional, help people, save people's lives, maybe that was important. But now I, I just focus on the things that are important in my life. My family is one of those, my friends, uh, my, my spirituality, my faith. Those are all things that are important to me that I spend time every single day nurturing and working on. So, you know, you also wrote a book that I can see, I think, behind you that is Sustainable Excellence. And, you know, it emphasizes on principles for leading, like, what do you call that? Uncommon and extraordinary life, you know. So can you highlight that? principle that has been particularly really impactful or you know what I say personally that you know that has helped you a lot that you would like to share today to the listeners sure so uh, the there's 10 principles in the book none of them are necessarily in any particular order number one is not necessarily any more important than number seven and it's always fun for me as an author when somebody reads the book and wants to reach out because there's always one of the 10 principles that really resonates with the reader. And there's one that resonates with me, even though I, I wrote all 10 of them. And, and I'll give you the, the principle, but it resonates with me in all honesty. I'm not proud that it resonates with me because I've done this. And the principle is this, most people think with their fears and their insecurities instead of using their minds. And I know I've done that. Oh, I wanna start a project. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I don't have enough information. Maybe I'm not smart enough. What will people say about me if I fail? That's thinking with our fears and our insecurities. That's not thinking with our minds. And I always, especially when I have an opportunity to speak to young people in person, I always try to tell them, if there's something in your heart, something in your soul that you believe you're supposed to do, but it scares you, go ahead and do it. Because at the end of your life, the things that you're going to regret are not going to be the things you did. They're going to be those things you didn't do. And by then it's going to be too late to go back and do them. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, I think I mentioned this in, in my uh, the podcast, well, podcast we did before as well, when you were there uh, about Jeff Bezos saying that, you know, you remember that, you know, the things that you're going to regret the most are the things you did not do. You know, and I think that that is significant because, you know, you had to go on the paths and explore. And, you know, I, I feel there are so many things, Terry, you know, we think we want to do, but we don't do because we are afraid of the society. We are afraid of others, you know, what they will think about us. And, you know, I think this approval from the family is really significant, you know, because sometimes they are not even understanding what are we thinking or what are we feeling. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it does not matter. They are their own self. We are our own self. So, you know, we have some feelings that they cannot feel. Your wife would not be feeling what you are feeling she you know in that sense i'm not talking about empathy i'm talking about like what you are having that experience is your experience it is not collaborative and that's what it is so you know when you feel that you need to you need to do something you need to do that you, you cannot rely on external opinions about what you need to do because this will only create problems because you know what the other person tells you is based on his perception his mindset his growth whatever how much he has grown you know and god has not really decided for 
you know, the other person, he, uh, who is he to decide for you? You have to decide for yourself. And God is with, in support. I think he's in support. He's not going to interfere. He's there. He's in support. If you're ready, he's ready. That's what I feel when I, I say this. You know, if somebody, you know, that's what it is. If you are ready, the universe is ready. But, you know, I feel when you have cancer or when you are going from some terrible, terrible time where, you know, you, there is no ray of hope. That this could like for you had I, I think that is the right word you know there was no ray of hope then how do you sustain uh terry then how do you sustain when you think okay nothing is going to work or nothing is working out then how do you sustain uh, terry please tell me so I'll, I'll give you a quote first and then i'll tell you a story that i think will answer your question the quote is from uh, a very famous author here in the united states by the name of ernest hemingway and he said life breaks everyone and afterwards, many are stronger at the broken places. And I, I love that quote because life does. Life breaks us all down at some point in, during our, our, our life. And we have a choice. Can we use that? You know, just like when you break a bone, that when that bone heals, a lot of times in the area where it was broken, it's stronger. It's tougher. It's more resilient when it heals. Can we use what we have? in terms of a, of a healing, whatever that is that we're experiencing in life, to make us more resilient, to make us stronger, to make us tougher? I think the answer is yes. And the story I want to tell you occurred back in the 1950s. And this is a true story. Uh, there was a professor at Johns Hopkins University here in the United States that did a very simple experiment with rats. He took rats and he put them in a tank of water that was over their head. And he wanted to see how long the average rat could tread water. And the average rat treaded water for about 15 minutes. And just as those rats were getting ready to sink and drown, he reached in, grabbed them, pulled them out, dried them off, and let them rest for a while. And then he took the exact same rats and put them back in that exact same tank of water. And the second time around, on average, those rats treaded water for 60 hours. Now think about that. The first time, 15 minutes. It's not like your business is gonna go under or you're gonna flunk a test. You're gonna die. Your life is going to be over. And the second time around, 60 hours, which taught me two things. Number one, the importance of hope in our lives. You just mentioned hope a minute ago. That if we know we're doing the right thing, more than likely, maybe not today, maybe not this month, maybe not even this year. But if we know we're doing the right thing, if we stay on the right path, there's a very good chance that somewhere down the road, we will get to the end of the rainbow, so to speak. We will find what we are looking for. And the second thing it taught me was just how much more our physical bodies can handle right. than we ever thought they could. We give up, we quit, we give in long before our body does, because our brains are hardwired to say, hey, that hurts or that's uncomfortable. Stop doing that. And we say, oh, okay, I'll stop doing that. No, you can, you can handle a whole lot more damage in terms of your body putting it through difficult things than you think you can. It's your brain that you need to control. And people ask me, how do you do that? How do you control your brain? Let me offer this suggestion to your audience. And I do this every day of my life. Every day, do one thing that scares you, that makes you nervous, that makes you uncomfortable, that is potentially embarrassing. It doesn't have to be a big thing. But if you do those small things every day, when the big disasters in life hit us, and they hit all of us, we lose our job, we find out we have a chronic or a terminal illness, our relationship goes down the drain, whatever it is. When those big disasters hit themselves, hit, you'll be so much more resilient to handle them than the people who never do difficult things in their life. So what like you do every day in that method that you just mentioned, what do you do? Like you said, be, do something that, you know, you're ashamed of or, you know, all of, like all of those things. What do you do every day, basically? It depends on the day. Like, uh, so I do... I do cold therapy. So when, when I take a shower, I turn the water all the way to as cold as it possibly gets. And I, and I put it all over my body. I hate it. it it's, it's terribly uncomfortable. 
but it's that little stressor that I'm putting on my body. It's okay, I'm really tired because I had treatment today. I need to get a little bit of a workout in. I need to keep my muscles strong and things like that, especially being in a wheelchair. So it, I mean, it could be, I hate going to the dentist. It could be picking up the phone and making your six month appointment to go get your teeth clean. It, 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 like I say, it doesn't have to be a major thing in your life, but if you do those uncomfortable things every day, one thing, get up in the morning, I, 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 I'll make, make your bed, just make your bed. You know, it's like, well, I don't want to make my bed. No, make your bed. Why do you make your bed in the morning? Because you get a win right out of the gate. First thing in the morning, you make your bed. You've got a win. You did something positive take, for take yourself. Res to take responsibility. Yeah, and, you know, exactly. And I, I remember, you know, this thing, you know, it, 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 it hit me a lot back then. It's been a while since I heard it. There was a military officer i think in japan or i don't remember he said that if you want to change the world not if it was japan i think it was korea sorry i think it was somewhere on there the asian side but you know, he said if you want to change the world he was a general by the way so he said if you want to change the world for good the first thing you need to do is start making your bed and you know and I, I, it was a powerful thing, you know, when I heard that, you know, why I, I, I used to wonder that time. Then, you know, I understood, you know, as I started to do that, you know, it was it, it is the first thing you do in your morning. It sets the, the, the right motive that, you know, I'm taking responsibility. I'm going to do what I have to do today, you know, and that is that is the right indication to give to your brain. Because, you know, see, our brains are wired. Our brains are conditioned. The way you condition it, the may, way you make it it becomes and the and the more it can handle the capabilities that you have terry right now i, I certainly believe that is 10 times more than somebody else who ha, ha, will have cancer not because you have made so much resilience to yourself doesn't mean he's not capable for that also but you know you have done so much work on it work on it that your mind is really strong you can handle so much now you know and and from outside, it does not look like that. You know, I, outside, you look normal. I look normal. But nobody knows what's going inside. And that's the thing. You know, that's the thing. Nobody really knows that, you know, what we actually go through. And we don't need to prove to others that, you know, okay, I'm suffering. Everybody is suffering. That's what the truth about life. If you want to hear the truth, it is everyone is suffering. But one is who the Buddha said, one who gets affected by suffering who wants to suffer, continue to suffer because he wants to get affected. And the Buddha said, the second are the people who don't want to be part of it. He said, okay, it's going to go on and on, but I'm not going to be attached to it. I'm not going to be, take part in it. I'm going to enjoy bliss. I'm going to take the bliss. I'm going to choose happiness, not sorrow. And that's what it is. So, you know, you played basketball in college. And I think sports... You know, I think people are not playing sports anymore. We tell you, you know that, like people, okay, all the time in smartphones, you know, all of those things. People are not playing sports. People are not even playing chess. But how has your sports background contributed to your mindset? I think that beginning that when it happened, I think that helped, you think? Yeah, it absolutely did. And, you know, and as I mentioned, you know, part of it is, is being part of something that's bigger than yourself. And the other part is learning how to interact with other people. You know, as I mentioned, you know, during COVID, when we were all separated, things weren't good. People, you know, all kinds of mental illness and things like that. We, we are designed to be creatures where we're, we're together. We do better. We function better when we're together. And that's what a team teaches you. That's what sports teaches you, how to get along with other people that you may not like, that you may not see eye to eye with but you're all working towards a common goal, a common good. And that's one thing that sports teaches you, even without you even realizing it. You know, I know how to work with people. I can talk to anybody. I can talk to people that are incredibly educated and people that have no education at all. I can, I can talk to rich people and poor people. I, I can talk to everybody. And as a matter of fact, that's one of the things that I recommend. Sometimes people will reach out to me and say, hey, I'm interested in being a police officer, I'm in, interested in getting into law enforcement, what do you recommend? And what I always tell them is put your devices down, go out on the street and talk to the homeless person, go up to the penthouse and talk to the rich person. Because if you can talk to people, you will be successful in that job. 
if you can't, if the only way you can communicate is, you know, on a little box, <laughs> you know, texting somebody, you'll be miserable being a police officer. It's, it's a face to face. It's a one on one kind of thing that you need to understand. So learn how to talk to other people. And I'll give you one more story. There's a there's a book called Do Hard Things. It's written by a man by the name of Steve Magnus. And Magnus was the track and field coach at the University of Minnesota here in the United States. And in the book, he talks about this particular uh, research study that was done at the university where they took young, young college people and they put them in a room. And the only thing in a room was a table and a chair. They were not allowed to have any devices with them whatsoever. The only other thing in that room was a buzzer. And if they hit the buzzer, they received an electric shock. 68% of the men and 25% of the women shocked themselves, including one guy who shocked himself on average every five seconds. They kept him in the room for about 20 minutes. And, and the, the outcome of the study was we're not comfortable in our own skin. We're not comfortable by ourselves. We're comfortable based on what somebody says on our iPad or on our iPhone or whatever that is. So this is another thing that I do every day so that I would like recommend to your to audience. Other? Like they were talking to each other? Why did like he keep hitting the buzzer? What were they doing, the activity? No, so you would it would be like they put you in a room and right. the only thing in the room was this table and chair and this buzzer. And you had to stay in the room by yourself for 20 minutes. And people would be like, I can't do that because I'm so tied to my devices that I need to, I need to shock myself. I need to wow. provide that stimulation. Wow. They cannot even hold and 20 so, minutes. They cannot even hold 20 minutes. I know it's, it seems so ridiculous, but based on reading that, one of the things that I do every day, and I would recommend again to your audience, is to disconnect. Just get rid of your devices, sit somewhere in a chair alone by yourself, for 10 minutes every day. We all waste 10 minutes. You can find 10 minutes to just sit alone with yourself. Be comfortable, not, not meditate, not pray, not let your mind go wherever your mind wants to go, but be comfortable in your own skin. What that study showed is that people aren't. We are comfortable based on what people say on these devices that we play on. We're not comfortable being alone with ourselves. And what will that 10 minutes do according to you? that it, it'll it'll make you comfortable in your own skin it, it'll allow you to have thoughts that are not tied to what somebody says on a screen let your thoughts go where they want to go let your dreams let your hopes let your worries go where they go get back in touch with yourself not based on what other people are saying about you on your devices so this is a significant question and don't get the wrong idea when I say it, but you know, uh, in, in the way I'm saying, who is a intelligent person and who is a dumb person? There are two people, you know, uh, Terry, according to you, who is someone you think, okay, this is a smart and this one who think he can be smart, but he is dumb. He is idiot. So uh, let me answer that with, with this story. So, most people know who Albert Einstein was, right. probably one of the smartest men in the world. Well, there's a story that goes, uh, one day Albert Einstein was asked, who is the smartest person that you know? And Einstein at the time was believed to be the smartest person in the world. And Einstein thought for a while and he said, my chauffeur. And the person said, your chauffeur is the smartest person in the world? He said, yeah. He said, why? He said, well, one day, I was being driven by him to uh, talk, to a lecture. And he said he looked in the rear view mirror and he saw that I was exhausted, that I was just very, very tired. And he said to Einstein, he said, hey, why don't I do your presentation in your place? You can rest, you can just sit in the audience. And Einstein said, that's a great idea. Because the chauffeur had been to all kinds of lectures that that Einstein had done. He had seen it. He knew Einstein's lecture by heart because he'd been to all of them. And so they, they changed clothes and, and the chauffeur went up on stage when they got there and gave the lecture. And Einstein sat in, in, the, in the audience. A reporter after the, lecture, after the lecture asked the chauffeur 
a, a very technical question about the theory of relativity. And the chauffeur said very smartly, he kind of laughed it off and he said, that is such an easy question. You know what? I'm going to let my chauffeur come up here and answer that question. So the chauffeur and Einstein traded places. Einstein came up on stage. Nobody knew Einstein. There was no social media back there. Right. They'd heard of him, but they didn't know what he looked like. Wow. So he gets up on stage, answers the question, and the chauffeur sits down. But nobody knows the difference. After that, nobody asked. <laughs> nobody asked another question because they figured, well, if the chauffeur's answering this, then we, these must be really dumb questions because only Einstein should be able to answer these. So. I, who's the dumbest? Who's the smartest? Who's the most intellectual? I, I, I don't think it has anything to do with education. I, I think it, one has to do with, do you know yourself? And two, what do you know about other people? How do you connect with other people? That's where the richness is. That's where life is really all about. It, it's, I mean, we can all know things and that's great. And we should, we should be lifelong learners. We should read books. We should do master classes. We should talk to people that are smarter than us. If you're the smartest person in the room, you need to find another room. And so, you know, it really is, it's the connections we have with each other. And I think people that understand that, I think those are intelligent people. The people who think, hey, it's all about me and no nothing else matters except me and my feelings and my wants. I don't think those are very bright people. Another question that comes to me, and I think it is very significant, and maybe you're one of the persons that I can ask this to, maybe personally, but you know, I'm asking on the public platform, is that what is faith and what is gratitude? What is faith and what is gratitude? Is that what you're asking? That's a good question. I, I guess let me start with gratitude. I, I think we should be grateful for everything. And, and I, I say that because when I go to the hospital and I still go to the hospital for an entire week, every three weeks, I see people who are suffering terribly. I see people who are at the end of their lives. I've seen people who just got the worst news of their life. And that really helps solidify the fact that I need to be grateful for what I have. Now, I've taken my ugliness, my pain, my discomfort, and I've used that in, in a grateful way, in a way that, okay, thank you for giving me that, God. And, and I truly mean this. One thing I, or two things I think cancer has taught me is number one, I don't think you truly know yourself until you've been tested by some form of adversity in your life. And number two, cancer's made me a better human being. And I, and I honestly believe that. I really think cancer has made me a better human being. So I am, in a way, grateful for cancer. And I know that sounds so ridiculous. And it's like, are you kidding? We, we, we try to eradicate it. We try to give you drugs or surgery and get rid of it. But I really am grateful for that. What is faith? I think faith is believing in something that's bigger than you, that you can't see or you can't understand. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of like if you ask me, what is love? I, I don't know. I know what it looks like, but I don't know if I could define it. You know, it, it's it's so big. It's so immense. You know, faith, hope and love abide. The greatest but of these is love. You have felt it. You have felt yeah. it. That's, yeah. that's what it is. And you know, once yeah. you have felt, you know, maybe it's hard to describe. Maybe it's indescribable. You know, how could you define God, how can you define love if not God? Like, how would you define love? It's no definition, you know, and that moment, you know, it's hard. You That silence cannot be described, you know, and someone who hasn't experienced that, it is hard to make him understand until, uh, you know, I, I say this to everybody, uh, you know, who hasn't experienced it is to first experience this because the moment you do, you will understand what I was saying, what, or you were saying that silence, why is it indescribable, you know, but if you, you know, what you said, you know, like the cancer thing has changed you, but I, I say to you, I say unto you, if you didn't have cancer today, or you never had cancer, you just didn't have cancer, your life would have been normal, you think it, it would have been you would have been such a person that you are today. I'm, I'm not saying, you know, in a way, but I'm saying, is your whole, I'm, I'm saying, don't get 
the wrong idea again because I'm asking a harsh question here. Is your whole morality today, Terry, is because you had cancer, you have developed yourself, and that all the good things you say is because you had cancer? If you didn't have it, would you be in such a good person that you are today is my serious question that I want to ask. Or would have been, you would have been that kind of a guy you don't want to be around much too much. I'm asking really honestly to you. Yeah, and, and that's a very, it's a good question. It's a fair question. I, I don't know. And, and, and part of me wants to say, I'm not sure I would be. I, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not that vain to think that I'm that good. I, I, I really, I, I think a lot of times, you know, how do you, how do you take a stone, a raw stone and make it a beautiful gem? You polish it. You, you, you use abrasives on it to make it look beautiful. Well, that's what cancer is. Cancer is an abrasive on my soul. Cancer is an abrasive on my heart. And it's in that abrasion has made me better. It's shined my goodness. It shined my positivity. Would I be the same person? I doubt it. I, I hope I would still be a good person, but would I be the person I am today? Absolutely not. And, you know, we all like to think we sort of have the moral high ground. I, I don't, I don't know if I would have been, you know, I don't know if I would have had the moral high ground. I mean, I, I still hope I would have been a good dad and a, and a good husband and a good brother and a good son, but would I, would I be what I am today? Absolutely not. And that's why, you know, in a way I'm grateful for that abrasive. I'm, I'm grateful. God said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to put your nose to the grindstone, so to speak. And I'm, I, and I'm going to use that to sharpen you, to make you better. And I think, think that has absolutely happened because I had cancer. You know, there was a, a question asked um, by one of the disciples to a guru that, you know, you say the universe takes care of us. God takes care of us. You know, he, he cares for us. If he does care for us, why were you, like, why was Jesus crucified? Why was so many great religious teachers, all those people have been crucified? Why some of the greatest people on you must have suffered so much? At least why was Jesus crucified? This was his question. Because if God was really kind, God really cared, why would he make me or everybody suffer? And this is Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, and, no, this is, this, and, so this is a story. This is a story, not a question. So the guru answered that... You know, you think, and you, it's a significant question, you know, he said, you asked that, you know, why does God make you suffer? Why did God make Jesus suffer? All of these people suffer that have done so good for humanity. But you think that was the suffering, but that was really their gift. That was their, the blessing of God, actually. To make them suffer has made Jesus. If Jesus was not crucified, the whole Christianity would never exist. It there was no way Christianity would have been here if Jesus was not crucified. It was that very moment God created the whole thing, if it had been created. The whole thing, you know, what happened with Buddha? If he hadn't left the palace, he wouldn't have been today. If he said, "Okay, I would live with my wife. I would live a happy, like be like a king and prince," the whole movement of Buddhism, such a noble thought, would have come to the universe because he decided to leave. He took the courage. That was the blessing, and he had to suffer a lot to get enlightenment. He had to. People know his story. He had to suffer too, too much. He was not less suffered too. He was. But you know, we don't understand Terry that a lot of the problems that we face in our life they enhance us. It's like a gold, right? The, the more you hammer it, the better it gets, the better it shines. And that is the hammer that God puts us through. So why don't we think for a moment that this problem that we're suffering to might make us more stronger than weak? Why are we letting it take in over us? We are much more stronger than we think. Our body can endure. You are a living proof of that. Our mind can endure much. We have to just expand ourselves. We can think we are infinite because we are connected to the source. And the source is infinite. The source is all powerful. And we are part of that. As said in the Bible, I love this verse, the simplest verse that could be, God created you in his own image. That means we are connected to the source. There is no way we are disconnected from him. But yes, we have to live that life. But that is a challenge. If you, as I said, that cancer that you have has been transformed and not for just you, but so many other people there whose life you have changed through your speaking, 
through your motivation, which could have happened if you just were a basketball coach in some school. Maybe, you know, that is what it is. But my next question is really significant again, and maybe you can answer it. Who are real friends? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> you know, there were people that I really thought if I ever got sick or, or if I ever had, you know, my fate turned in a downward direction, that they would be there for me. They would support me. Uh, I was diagnosed with cancer when I was 51 years old, so relatively young still in life. And there were numerous friends, people that I thought were close friends that were like, mm, no, I, I, I can't deal with that. I can't deal with you being 51 years old and being told you're going to be dead in two years. I can't deal with it. I, I need to step away from you. And then there were people who I never expected to be in my foxhole, so to speak, you know, to be there when the bullets started flying and, and, and the enemy started attacking that have never left my side from day one. And so who are your friends? I think they're the people that, that love you enough to tell you the truth, even if that truth might impact the relationship you have with those, per those people. And I, I've always said, and I, I, I tell this especially to young people, your life is really gonna be dictated by the five people you hang around with the most. If you hang around with people that are that are smart, that are good, that have good character, that want good things in life, then you'll be smart. You, you'll have good character. You'll want good things in life. Whereas if you hang around with people that it's all negativity, it's all about drama, it's all about them, then your life will be all about drama and negativity. So I always tell people, be very careful the people that you hang around with because they will shape you on how you want to be. So hang around with people that make you better. Choose your and friends carefully and choose exactly your very enemies, carefully. even more carefully because even your enemies, not just friends, both of them influence your thought process. Yes, because yes. enemy makes you who? How can I fight this guy? And in terms of friends, how can I be like him? How could I take what he has, that compassion, that love, or something that you like about him? That you know, you think this is something you know I love about you. Wow, can I, how can I be like that? But right. you know, and. And if you want to really know, Terry, like who has a control over you, just see who you cannot criticize. I heard this uh, thing someone said, and I think I agree to it a lot. I, I absolutely agree. And, and that's, you know, what, what do we do? You know, I mean, if you have people in your life that love you enough, that care about you enough to say, hey, Terry, mm, I wouldn't do that. You know, that's a mistake. That's not good for you. What do we usually do with those people? We kind of ostracize them. We push them out of our lives. It's like, how dare you? I, I want to do this. How dare you not tell me that? You're not my friend. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> those people are your friends. Those people love you enough that they're willing to sacrifice the relationship they have with you in order to tell you the truth. Honestly. You should have as many of those people in your life as you possibly can and, and not get rid of them. Uh, there was a president here in the United States, a man by the name of Abraham Lincoln, fairly uh, fairly famous president in the U.S., whose cabinet, who, whose advisors he took from the people who ran against him for president and from the other party because he wasn't looking at party politics. He was looking at what's best for the country. And whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, whether you're on my side or you're not on my side, you have special gifts and talents, and I want to use those to make this country go forward. That's how we should all operate. We shouldn't look at somebody like, well, you're different from me, so I don't want you around. I want different people around me because they're going to give me different opinions, different thoughts because they've had different experiences in their lives. You know, uh, when we had our, and, and it's really what you said, you know, I think it's it's great, but, you know, you you remember when you when we had a last conversation, you were telling me, I think that was an interesting thing that just caught my, in my mind. You were telling me you got your leg amputated. And, you know, you, you, it was like the peak of COVID when you had to have that thing. And, you know, there was nobody at the hospital. You had to, you remember that story you were telling me you, when you had to, can you, can you, can, can you tell me about that story? I, I really want, I think I want to hear it again. 
Sure. So when I was was diagnosed with my latest round of cancer, which was back in 2020, right in the middle of the COVID pandemic, uh, I found out that my entire lower leg was full of cancer and I would need to have an above the knee amputation. And I also found out these tumors in my lungs. Well, at the time, hospitals here in the United States were pretty much not doing surgery unless it was an absolute emergency. But my leg was broken by the tumor that started all this. And so my doctor was like, look, I don't have, I can't put him in a cast. It's not going to heal because he's got a broken leg. I have to take the leg off. So we had to get special permission to actually do the surgery. The morning of the surgery, my wife literally dropped me off at the hospital. There was a nurse waiting for me at the front door of the hospital. I got out of the car into the wheelchair and was taken back into the pre-op room. Now, my wife was like, what, what am I supposed to do? Like my husband's having his leg amputated. I can't be there. I was not allowed to have anyone with me. I said, just, just hang out in the parking lot until the doctor calls you. The doctor agree, was gonna call her when the surgery was over. So I was wheeled into this pre-op room and it's this large kind of cavernous room that's divided into like 30 different bays, all designed to be prepping people for all different kinds of surgery. I was the only person in that room and the sound or the silence was almost deafening. And it was all I could do not to run away. I, I was so scared. I had a nurse and I had an anesthesiology resident and myself, that was it. And I remember I was supposed to be in the hospital for 10 days to two weeks after the surgery to learn how to function without a leg. And because of COVID, they sent me home 48 hours after having my leg taken off. So it was a very scary, it was a very difficult time in my life. Um, and it was, it was not something I would recommend for anybody. But again, I knew I had to callous my mind. I knew I had to control my mind. Because like I said, my mind was like, you got to get the heck out of here. You got to run. You got to get, you know, it was the sort of fight or flight syndrome. I was definitely in the flight. I want to get out of here. I don't want to do this. But I knew I had to. In order to save my life, I had to take my leg off. You know, the, I had to take a part of me that had been with me for 60 years and give it up in order to try to heal myself. And that was a hard thing to come with. And literally, I had like days to, to, dis, to make this decision, days to do this. It wasn't like I had a month to think about it and, and remunerate about it and pray about it. No, it was like, boom, we know we got to take your leg off. Four days later, I am in the OR having my leg removed. So it wasn't like I had a lot of time to kind of get my mind right. That's what callousing your mind does for you. That's what doing those hard things every day does for you. Because some of the, sometimes these difficulties, they're on you like that. I mean, you, know, you, you don't have time to prepare for them. They just happen. You got to be strong before you go into those things. And, you know, you mentioned uh, also that uh, last time we had a conversation about, you know, one time you were at the hospital because you've been to hospital more times than you can remember, I'm sure. But, you know, <laughs> so you were telling me about, you know, one time there was, uh, it was like, something had to be injected on your veins and you know there was a nurse who was doing that and you got mad on her like you know you, you didn't want to do but you know you really like was in the moment you did and then you apologized later but can you tell me a little bit about that moment what happened because you, know, you said you were like just you know not feeling the best I, I wasn't and 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 I made a conscious decision when I got cancer back in 2012 that I was never going to take out my fear, my anxiety, my uh, fatigue on a nurse, a doctor, a therapist, somebody who was trying to help me heal or get better. And because I've had so many IVs and infusions and things like that, they were having a hard time getting an IV needle in me. And they sent this one nurse in and, and she tried a couple times and I was giving her a hard time. I'm like, no, don't go there. You're not going to get it. No, don't go. She went there anyway. I'm like, I told you. And I was, I was being a jerk is really what I was. I was, I was not being positive. I, I was tired. I was beat up. But that's not an excuse. And, and so I eventually, she, she's like, I can't get this. Bring somebody else in. And she left. Well, a couple of days later, I found her again. And I said, look, I want to apologize to you. 
because I took out my frustration, my fatigue on you. And she's like, oh, no, 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 no. I said, no, 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 <laughs> no, you, I need to apologize to you. This isn't something you can just let go. I did not treat you the way you deserve to be treated. You were doing the best you can. You were trying to help me. You were trying to get this IV needle in me so I could be treated and you weren't able to do it. And I was being a jerk about it. So yeah, I, I apologize to her. And I, I've done that a couple times with people where it's like, I said something kind of rash I've never been horribly rude. I've never cussed anybody out. But there are just things where when I think back on it, I'm like, yeah, that wasn't one of your best moments, Terry. You, you, you need to go apologize to this person. And, and I think people appreciate that. And it, it, may, it keeps me like, hey, don't get too big for your britches. You know, don't, don't, don't get uh, conceited and think, you know, you're all that. You're not. You're not. These people are trying to help you. And so, yeah, I, I am not above apologizing when I do something wrong. You know, being being a high school coach, basketball coach, you have been for a long, long time in your life, you know, being in terms connected to the police, being all of those things, becoming a coach later on, all of those things, how do you teach or approach individual coaching where you have to just not teach people about methods, but about the truths of life, you know, a, telling them, you know, and giving them the, the mindset that, you know, how could you sustain? And, you know, I think a lot of times you had to teach some of the entrepreneurs too, who are really young. Maybe you had some of those people to come to you, you know, to like, okay. So how do you, you know, because especially young people have that ambitious mindset. Every, most of the young people live in that future that, you know, Two years from now, I'm going to be there. Two years from now, I'm going to hear. I think you were the one too, like when you were 50 or 51, like I'm going to do what I'm going to do tomorrow. Um, <laughs> next week, I want to be in Timbuktu, Hawaii. <laughs> so I don't know. And cancer came from no way. And, you know, we planned so much, Terry, but something can happen this early moment and we're finished. All those plans, all those things go to vain. And that's what I'm asking, you know, how, what and how do you teach individuals? What do you teach them when you teach them about the mindset? How do you do that? I, I don't think a good coach tells people how to do something. I, I, I mean, let me, let me sort of back up. What I do is I ask them questions. And I hope that my questions will get them to arrive at the solution or the idea that I'm trying to plant in their mind. Because if I just give it to you, a lot of times it doesn't stick. And you know, there's, there's an old uh, saying that says, never tell a story without making a point and never make a point without telling the story. So what I try to do is ask questions like, what would you do if this happened? And how would you react if this occurred in your life? And where do you see yourself at, at this point in time? And what if this occurred? In so, so I want to ask questions to get them to start thinking so that, you know, sort of in a roundabout way, they get to where I'm looking at instead of just saying, well, if you want to do that here, do this. I don't want to do that because that's not going to stick with them. They have to, they have to internalize it. They have to mentally process it in their own mind and, and get all those turns in as they're getting there. And then that'll stick. So I just, it, and it depends on the person. It depends on what they want. It depends on what they're looking for. It depends on, you know, are they one of these people that are driven and they don't see anything else in the world but themselves and their goals? Or are they more open-minded, more intellectual, more understanding that we get to the end of the rain or the pot at the end of the rainbow together? Not, not by yourself. You're, you're never, there's no such thing as an overnight success. Everybody fails who's successful. But so many people don't think you do. It's like, well, that person's great. You know, they probably never. No, they failed all the time. You just didn't see it. And what you see now is the outcome of that failure. So we talk, when I talk to people, we talk about failure. What does failure mean to you? What does it look like for you? How would it affect you if you fail? And because you can't be successful without understanding failure, I don't believe. And so we talk about failure. We talk about what would it look like if you didn't do this or if, it, if you were not successful at this? How would you feel? What would other people say? How would that make you feel? So it's, I, I just ask a lot of questions and get them to kind of remunerate on it. But looking ahead, you know, 
life is still so many surprises you might know it might offer you know i i know when we had the last time conversation i said the same thing and i'm asking the same thing again that thing i remember if the technology is growing so fast okay everything is happening you know so many new diseases to so many new cures of old diseases are coming out if some way something comes out for cancer and spe- specifically for your disease and uh, you can be healed i mean your leg cannot technically come back it's gone but uh, let's suppose you know you could get your life back for once and you, know, you could go out you could just maybe run if i have to be honest with you for a while what would you do if you were like in in the sense again normal in the sense you know again given your life back what would you do differently that you think okay now you have lived another part but you know i asked this question to so many people what would you have done differently that what you have done to if you are healed now if you are okay now what would you do differently i in all honesty i don't think i would do anything differently i think this is what i am supposed to do now whether i have cancer or whether i don't have cancer my story is still a story that i think resonates with people. I mean, I've told my story so many times where it is really people, it's taking people's breath away. It's like, oh my gosh, I could never have done that. And and depending on the kind of mood I'm in, sometimes I'll joke with them and it's like, yeah, you're right. You couldn't have done it because you've already defeated yourself in your mind. You've already told yourself, I can't do that. If you're going to do that, you're right. You're never going to do it. But if you say, I'm just going to try, I'm going to give it the best I, I, I can, and I'm going to let the chips fall where they may, However that looks like, whatever that happens. I mean, when I got cancer, did I ever expect to have my leg amputated? No, no, I really didn't. And, but it was, it was finding that purpose at that time. And a lot of times we talk about purpose in the singular, (coughs) excuse me, like it's one thing, like we're supposed to do one thing in life. And at least from my perspective and some other people I've spoken with as well, that that word should be in the plural, purpose is. And so when I was young, I felt my purpose was to be an athlete. And then when I got into adulthood, I felt my purpose was ultimately to be in law enforcement and to be a negotiator. And now, as I'm all, you know, all honesty coming to the end of my life, I, I think my purpose has changed again. And I don't think that purpose would change whether I had cancer or whether I was healthy and didn't have cancer. So I, I guess I would hopefully suggest to your, to your audience that if you're doing what you are doing and you feel it's your purpose, then it shouldn't matter all the things that are going on around it, whether you're sick, whether you're healthy, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether your relationship is good, whether it's not good, whatever it is. I mean, those things are all important. You need to address them, but that still doesn't go to the core of your purpose. If that's what your purpose is, then stay the course. Do, keep doing what you're supposed to do. Because I think God will change your purpose when it's the right time, if it is the right time. And I guess the last thing I'll say about this is we like to think that our purpose should be aligned with our job or our occupation. And it would be great if it could be, but it doesn't have to be. You know, your job could be over here. It's what you do to pay the bills, but your purpose is over here. And it's to be a podcast host, to be an artist, to be a writer, whatever you feel in your heart, it's supposed to be. So don't think that your purpose has to be your job. It doesn't. But you have unique gifts and talents. Figure out what those unique gifts and talents are and do things that sort of play to the strengths of those gifts and talents. And I think you're on your way to finding your purpose. My last question to you, you know, I think it's a really cute question, if I have to use the word. How has your relationship with your daughter been since cancer? I mean, before it has been, must have been great. But, you know, after cancer, these last few, like so many years, how has the relationship changed? And I really want to know because, you know, a daughter and a father's relationship is so, so different than a, uh, like a, uh, like a boy's relationship with his dad. You know, it's, it's really different. So I want to know that perspective. I'm really curious. Yeah, that, <laughs> it's, it's funny you, you, asked, you asked me that question. My wife and I were talking about this last night. So when my wife got pregnant and we went to the doctor and the doctor said, do you want to know what the sex of the baby is? And we were like, sure. And she said, well, you should buy pink. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you need to keep it in there till it's done. I know nothing about raising a girl. I have 
two brothers, no sisters. I went to an all boys Catholic high school and I went to an all male military college. So I had no idea how to deal with a girl, but my daughter and I are incredibly close. My wife talks about it as she's like a mini you. And I am so glad that I have that relationship with her. I am so glad that we are, that we are close, that we can talk about stuff. Uh, she said something to us when she was in college. She called home one day and she said, you know, mom and dad, I am so happy that I have the relationship that I have with you because so many kids here hate their parents. And I, I think how horrible that must be to be a parent. I mean, to give life to another human being and then to have that human being hate you. And I know there's things you can do to mess that relationship up and stuff like that. But I've always felt that, you know, when she was growing up, we were the parent. We had to make the hard decisions. We, we weren't your friend. We weren't, you know, we were the parents. But then when your daughter becomes an adult and our daughter is married, so she, she has a husband, they don't have any children yet, that relationship changes. It's, it becomes more of a, I'm not your parent. I'm more, we're more like friends now, you know? And, and yeah, I'll give you my opinion, but at the end of the day, you're an adult. You, you got to decide what you're going to do and how you're going to tackle this situation. But I just feel grateful that she calls home so much and, uh, hey, we're thinking about doing this. What do you think about that? I mean, if she didn't value our opinion, she wouldn't do that. So, I, I mean, I cancer has made me much closer to my daughter. It's given me an opportunity to talk with her, to be alone with her, to, to just talk about life. I mean, when I was a policeman, I used to work nights. And so I worked 11 at night till seven in the morning. And what I would do, we had a ritual every night after dinner, I would put our daughter to bed. We would, when she was little, you know, we would read books. We would just lay there and talk about things about her day and stuff like that. And those are the most precious things that I have in my life. Those are the things I'll always remember having those intimate. Well, okay. Tell me about your day. Well, what did your friend do? Okay. How about that? And we would just read books. Dad, what, what does that mean? It's a, it was just, it was a great bonding experience. And then I would go take a shower and I'd go to work, but I never left for work without a hug, a kiss, and a careful daddy. That's, I got that from her every single time. Even if she was traveling with my wife, it would be on the phone before I would go to work. Hug, kiss, and careful daddy. Those are the most what important things to me daddy? in my life. What is careful daddy? Just be careful. Because I, I was a policeman, you know, it was like, careful daddy. It's like, okay, you know, just be careful. Come home. So. And you just have one daughter, is that right? That's correct. So are you are you happy about it? Are you ever thought you know having another child? Like even you know, my wife and I have talked about that. I, the problem was I was working nights. My wife was working days. I mean, you can do the math. You know, when you're when you're not together, right. when you're on different sleep schedules and things like that, it it, it makes it very difficult uh, just to raise one child and and not to have another. We we would have liked another child, but we are incredibly grateful for the daughter that we have. So as we wrap up this uh, episode, Terry, with you, any last thought to the listeners who have been listening to us till now? Any, any final inputs you know, that you think we have talked about? So many great things, so many stories today. Any last thoughts you would like to add? Yeah, I'll tell you one final story. Um, a couple months ago, I had one of the nurses that was taking care of me when I was getting my infusion. And she asked me, what was it like to have your your foot amputated, and then to have your leg amputated. And I told her, I said, it, it certainly has not been easy. I, I'm six foot eight inches tall. So learning to walk again, falling is not an option. You get hurt when you fall from this height. But what I told her was, cancer can take all my physical faculties, but it can't touch my mind, it can't touch my heart, and it can't touch my soul. And that's who I am. That's who you are. That's who everybody who's listening to us is. And we spend a tremendous amount of time working on this, this body, this vessel. We, we exercise, we eat right, we get enough rest, we try to reduce stress. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. You absolutely should. But what I am suggesting is this. Maybe every day, spend a little more time working on who you really are, your heart, your mind, and your soul. We know this body is going to die at some time. It's going to decay and it's going to go away. But your heart, your mind, and your soul those things are eternal. Those things live on. 
And I just don't think we spend enough time working on who we really are. Thank you so much, Terry, for joining me today on Zest to Live. You know, I'm so grateful that you know you have you are here with me, and you know we talked such a while back, and you know we have been connected since then. And you know, like I could invite you back, and you came here for another episode, and it it is so fun having you always because you bring so much positivity. Like every time you come on, like it's. I cannot believe you have cancer. I've, I've said this before also. It's hard for me to even think about it. Like, how are you living, man? So, you know, this always makes me, you know, think that, you know, we are... so Because if you can, then I can. That's what I feel. That's what you yeah. say every day. That if you can, why cannot I? And if I can, why cannot others? And that's what we have to learn from people like Terry and other people who have been on this podcast sharing their powerful story and each day when I, when I talk to these guests Terry the thing I learn is that there is so much to life there are so many new perspectives that you know I have never thought I have never experienced you know I cannot know what you have gone through nobody can only you know that but at the same time that is what is life and that's what which if ever you're in somewhere else if not in this body you would think about you know, this is a life lived you know so live a life of prosperity live a life not not of regret but of love and that's where you know the good things can happen to you because if you are reflecting love the universe should reflect it back if you reflect hate it's going to come back to you man it's going to come back to it's not going to it's not going to come back to you you cannot you know it's going to come back to you so be grateful for the moment be grateful for who you are be truthful be honest you know and rest man will take care and you are there to do yourself so thank you so much terry again for joining me on zest to live which is a louvre original podcast i'm so glad gladful to be, be, you being here well thank you very much for having me on i really enjoyed talking with you again thank you so much Welcome to Luvo. This is your home screen, giving you access to all features like steps counter, water intake, mood check, heart rate, sleep, and gratitude. You can also monitor your steps, heart rate, and sleep by connecting the app with your smartwatch. Experience live meditation, yoga, and healthy eating, all of which is coming soon. Download our free app and start living your best life.